Anyway, the, the whole notion is that when you do this, you call the names of ancestors that you want to never forget, and that we never forget them makes them continue to live on and on and on. So with that being said, um, we're going to start to ask that all of us here think about first names of ancestors that you would like to mention to have them their presence. It could be family ancestors. It could be liberation ancestors. It could be ancestors that um, have made recent transition, like um, many who left us last year and last few years. So um, without any further ado, Mother, Father, God, ancestors, deities, and saints, um, by whatever name you are called, we ask that you be present here with us this day in our tribute, uh, commemoration tribute to Malcolm X. Ashe. We ask that all of those here and the family members here and the extended family members of those who are here also be considered uh, to be forever in uh, our prayers, those who have left us, those who are here now, and those who are coming forth in the future. Ashe. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask us to start to call out the names of ancestors who we would like to be recognized and for uh, all of us to acknowledge that, of course, we're here to commemorate uh, al Haj Malik al Shabazz and Malcolm X Ashe. Now, at this point, we don't have any major kinds of, of, of preferences. If you want to call out the name of an ancestor who is an ancestral warrior, queen, king, do that. If you want to call out an ancestor who is family, warrior, king, queen, nurturer, loving parent, loving ancestor, loving grandparent, do that. I'm going to call out Bantu Steve Biko. Ashe. Ashe. Please call him out. Start calling him out now. Leola Porter. Ashe. Ashe. Marcus Garner. Ashe. Ashe. Dr. Betty Shabazz. Ashe. Ashe. Carl Rose. Ashe. Ashe. Dr. John. Ashe. 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 Thank you, thank you. For ancestors called, ancestors who were not called, we give thanks. May we never forget those who made it possible for us to be here. Yeah. I should. I should. I should. I should. I should. Thank you, Jadwar, for, for facilitating the uh, libation. We, we're going to move quickly and try and truncate our program. You know we got started late because of the previous program that was here. I, I'm going to introduce the uh, members of the Positive Black Folks in Action. And I think we have about five or six of them here. And they, they're going to make uh, comments for about three minutes each. And then we'll uh, go, we have a, um, a wonderful poem from Sister Nubia. And then we'll go uh, to um, Professor Bailey. But uh, let me just take a moment. Uh, I'll start with uh, our fearless coordinator, Dr. Sharon Kahn, is a lifelong community activist, hails from Mount Vernon, New York. A former New York City banker, uh, she helped Peter Bailey open his first bank account. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> For over 50 years. Uh, and she has served numerous boards, one in particular, the Mount Vernon Community Action Group, where Dr. Betty Shabazz, the wife of Brother Malcolm, uh, directed a wide med program for pregnant young girls. She's a graduate of George Washington University and Fordham University, and currently she's the Chief uh, Administrative Officer for an educational institution here in D.C. Sharon. Way back when. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I was only 16 years old, and I lived in Mount Vernon, New York, when Brother Malcolm was assassinated. I remember it was a cold Sunday evening when I heard the news that he was killed in the Audubon Ballroom, a place that many black people frequented on Saturday nights. My parents and their friends would take the trolley from New Rochelle, New York, 
down to 241st Street, take the subway to the Audubon. Back then, many Northerners um, thought Brother Malcolm was a radical and too radical for us. And as an obedient child, we listened to our parents, unfortunately. Brother Malcolm's death made national news, but the media still deemed him as a militant black Muslim who hated white people. That was the miseducation of Americans, as I call it. The late Gil Noble became the host of the only program that featured stories about blacks in 1968. The program was called Like It Is, and it aired on ABC. It was after Bro Brother Malcolm's death that Gil Noble featured more stories about the late um, uh, Malcolm X and other revolutionaries. When I was in high school, Malcolm's book came out. And my then boyfriend said, you need to read it, you need to read it. But I still wasn't on board. And I actually didn't really jump on board until a few years later when I met Peter Bailey mm -hmm. in the bank. He worked in the Time Life building. I was a New York banker downstairs. And he wrote for Ebony and Jet magazine. And he would come in and show us the articles. And I was like, but I never forgot him. And years later, I heard him on a radio station in Richmond. And um, he said he was moving to Washington, D.C. And I called in. And at that time, aging myself, there were very few minorities that worked in the banks. So I think he kind of, you know, remembered me. So when he moved to this area, I, brought my, I called him up, again, reintroduced myself to him. Brought my family to his apartment. He was living on Georgia Avenue at the time. And um, the rest is history. We've been kind of joined at the hips ever since. And the more you get involved in understanding Malcolm X, um, understanding you know, what he stood for, black nationalism, um, you just, you know, for me, as I said, that was a turning point in my life. And I was so fortunate to have met uh, Mr. Bailey you know, way back then. He's been my mentor for all these years. Until this day, we talk probably at least three or four times a week. And um, um, I remember Peter had this play called Malcolm, Martin, and Megan. And we had numerous readings of the play. And I said, Peter, we need to have a full production of this play. We finally did 2018 at the Art Theater here in Washington, D.C. We put on a full production of his play, and it was phenomenal. Ibrahim, his wife, and a bunch of us were all involved in that process. And uh, Malcolm's daughter, the youngest one, Malak, she was also featured in a play along with his great nephew. So it was a real tribute to, not only to the family, but to help continue Malcolm's legacy. That's what Positive Black Folks in Action is. We're about um, trying to make sure we maintain and retain the legacy of Brother Malcolm and of those other warriors who basically, you know, help us to learn more about ourselves. Because I come from an era where we didn't learn black history. Fast forward to 2021, what are they trying to do now? Erase our history. And that's not going to happen, okay? Because I know people like you, Sankofa, thank God for Sankofa, we need to have more bookstores like this in our neighborhoods, et cetera. So we need to do whatever we can to keep that legacy alive. So thank you, Peter Bailey. And I'm just going to say this. I know he didn't want me to say anything, but I'm going to say it. And we know how we are. We just say what we want to say. Peter's birthday is Friday, OK? And I just want everybody just to say happy birthday to him. He didn't want to be. I do have your cake in my car. <laughs> He wanted a pound cake. I tried to make one last night. It really didn't come out the way I wanted to. So I told my son, I said, I need a cake to bring to Peter because Friday is his birthday. I want you to kind of join me and wish you Peter Bailey a happy birthday. You would just say happy, happy birthday. birthday. Yeah. All right, moving right along. Next, where's uh, our next member of the Positive Black Folks in Action is David Dennison. Where's David? Uh, David is a, uh, a consultant and an expert in security. Some of you who live in Washington, D.C. know he, in, in the old days, you, when you met, went to a party and you, people told you they worked for the government, you knew what was up. 
but he works for the government. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to say that I wasn't alive when Brother Malcolm, unfortunately, was assassinated, but subsequently, by studying and reading, I became a disciple of Malcolm X. And when I was younger, I used to wear a shirt. I was, you know, remember the shirt saying, my enemy necessary with him with a gun. But then I was thinking, do I want to fall into the media narrative of Malcolm being violent because it's not explained? So what I started doing is telling kids about the Malcolm who said, I can't spend 15 minutes without reading. I study all kinds of history, not just African history, European history. Malcolm was also almost like a mini Egyptologist. I listened to a tape where he was talking about the movement of Abel Simbel in Nubia. So Brother Malcolm was, as Mr. Bailey said, a master teacher. And when you lose a master teacher, the community suffers. I want to take this time to thank Mr. Bailey for keeping the real Malcolm X alive. Thank you. Enjoy the program. Josh Myers, who's a professor, Dr. Myers, over at Howard University. He's traveled, but I, there's a gentleman who's here to represent, who has a statement from Josh, Samuel Anthony. Come on up, Brother Samuel. <laughs> Samuel, I got a chance to meet the first time uh, several weeks ago when he was working with, there was a program here honoring uh, Marcus Garvey mm -hmm. and the, the new revised book by his son, Dr. Julius Garvey. Yeah. Okay, Samuel. Peace out. Uh, I'm Samuel Anthony. I'm a Africana Studies Scholar at Howard University. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So my take with Dr. Myers said, uh, Malcolm X's meaning still resonates in the moment, for it will always. There is a consistent pulse and rhythm animated by Brother Malcolm's insistence on our humanity, insistence on our freedom dream. Malcolm X made us believe because we always believe. So what I love about his word and his work was how that belief found a model, a way of being articulated so beautifully, how it became a plan. As John Henry Clark and Malcolm Interloker once intoned, we gotta continue to plan. What are we planning now? How does Malcolm's rhythm, our people's rhythm found us now? I know we will find it because of elders like A.P. or Bailey. I know we will be free because we never stop dreaming of it. As the beat goes on, be confident that Malcolm's living and dying was not in vain. No. For as long as we remember, and we will always remember, Malcolm will live on forever. Long live Malcolm. Long live Black Resistance. And long live the rhythm. Thank you. Next member of the Positive Black Folks in Action is the brother who you've been seeing running around here with me, Jawara Hunter. Uh, this, this brother is very quiet, unassuming, and humble, but you may not know, he's a medical doctor. Yes. Uh, you know, I don't mean a fake medical doctor, I mean a real <laughs> But the... What we know about this brother, Jawar, is that he he will do anything, wash the floor, break down tables, you know, bring in the food, you know, whatever it takes to make the program go. And so we appreciate it. And I got to say this, he'll be embarrassed. Oh, we have a grandson who wanted to go to medical school and was having trouble negotiating that process and also raising money for all that. Uh, what do you call fees that you have to send with the application? And Jawara made it happen. And I'm here to say you, to you tonight that that young grandson that you helped graduated last year from the uh, Minneapolis Medical School and is now at the Cleveland Clinic doing his residency. Wow. Much of a pleasure it's been to be around Brother Bailey. I think we started knowing each other 
maybe 1985, walking around Hall and looking around and talking about different things. But Malcolm's legacy was always uh, important to him. And um, again, um, Brother Bailey's written several books, and we've all kind of been able to be exposed to Malcolm's work. And I think the uh, take-home point is that Malcolm never stopped loving us, and we should never stop loving ourselves. I guess I'm also a member, and I'm gonna. I'll take a couple of minutes to say something. I'm Ibrahim Mukman. I'm a semi-retired community economic development consultant, and I, I, this is my brother. He's also my neighbor. I live in Shaw. Lived in Shaw for a long time. Let me just say a couple of things. Uh, when I heard of Malcolm X was killed, I was a 17-year-old um, high school student working at Scratch and Shoe Store in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, a year and a half earlier, I had gotten locked up because I wanted to go to the old white library in Columbus, Georgia, called Bradley Library, and they told me Negroes can't go there. And and I said the mistake that they made is that my high school teacher told us we had to memorize the, the Declaration of Independence and, and portions of the Constitution, and 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 you were supposed to be tested. And what I told her, I was 15 years old when it happened. I said that the test of whether or not I understand how the government works is not me standing up in front of you regurgitating the Declaration of Independence and portions of the Constitution. The test is how do I apply that here in Columbus, Georgia? Mm -hmm. And I said, this situation is jacked up. This was nine years after Brown versus Board of Education, but Columbus, Georgia refused to accept uh, the Supreme Court decision in, in a case. And so we went on. But one of the things that I love about Malcolm, even though the paper there was saying he's an extremist, stay away from him, don't touch him, you know, like you yeah. get in real trouble. I remember that scene, and Peter can attest to it when he talks, where Malcolm was on the floor in the Audubon, and there was a woman holding his head. And I said, you know, she doesn't look like she's a black woman. And it was uh, Yuri Kachi Kuchiyama. And so all those stories people were telling about Malcolm, you know, the reality is that he was a really a good person. Nobody was ever killed like what happened we saw yeah. at the Capitol here. But anyway, I'm just happy to be a part of learning from A.P. to Bailey. And God blessed me to be able to participate in 1985 at the South African Embassy getting locked up. And I, I felt good five years later when Nelson Mandela walked out of prison. Thank you. Now, where is Sister Nubia? Oh, she's here. Sister Nubia Kai is going to come up and she has a poem. Sister Nubia is a, she's a Renaissance woman. She's a, a professor at, at Howard University. I don't know where else she's taught. She's a poet, a, uh, a playwright, uh, an interdisciplinary uh, historian and scholar. But revolutionary, and she's and she's our sister, Sister Nubia. This is a poem I wrote many many years ago, back in the 1970s. In fact, when Malcolm's impact was huge, not just in the United States but around the world. called Malcolm. Good men don't die. They stay around and take root in a cotton tree. And this tree grows in a field that is barren. But because it is proud and firm and strong, its very presence inspires other sprouts to thrive and become great trees also. And when I speak to my children of you, Malcolm, this is what I will tell them. That you wore glasses and had a short crop beatnik beard, but you wasn't no beatnik. Even when you beat tricky dip in old white Saint Nick. I will tell my children these things. That you were tall, a giant, not an ugly giant, a beautiful giant with sandy red hair and a boyish smile and even a few freckles. I will tell them this, and the legends will grow. 
I will tell them how you destroyed John Henry when you told him he was an old Uncle Tom nigger for working himself to death for white folks who give a hoot about him. And I will tell them when you spoke how your voice traveled all over the world. I will tell them how you raised the dead on the Statue of Liberty's carcass and lifted the motherland with your hands and brought her near to us. Think they'll believe me, Malcolm, when I tell them that you made it rain for us, that you were the rain that brought life to us when we were dead, dead, dead as your father's burning flesh under a railroad track. Dead as the men who murdered him. Dead as your mother's mind went when she saw him. Shall I tell them how your words, quickened with the force of lightning, entered the holes in our heads and became seeds? See how we have grown in this barren wilderness of prairie and cactus and crushed Indian head skulls. See how we have grown out of the bloody sea, the stinking ships, the cotton fields, see how we have grown out of the dusky earth on the wings of the boss perched high in our branches. I will tell them you were Prince Sabaz, son of Elijah, Luke Mon, Prophet Muhammad, descendant of the line of Abraham, that you arose out of a mountainous forest, that you cleared a path for us and taught us not to fear the beast that roamed in its midst. You said, yes, animals are flesh and blood and can die just as we die. See how we have grown, who didn't know the Aryan horn was made of glass that we were dealing with a child warrior painting pictures on Sundiata's helmet. See how we have grown, who didn't know our own fragile entrails were overcooked chitlins till you showed us men were not flesh but light, born of Allah's morning. And on the morning of the great feast, on the singing hills where you walked and left this tomb, we will be free. One day, our people will be free, free as the bars unharnessed from the American dollar bill and mounted on this hill. I will tell them, and the legends will grow like the shoots around the cotton tree. They will grow in these words that you are a hewer of stone, a welder of nations, a maker of men, a master of self, a man with the spirit of the sun, that you were a teacher, a leader, a prince, and we will love you always. I will tell my children these things, and they will listen. Uh, I have a book called Solos. It was, here, was sold here at uh, St. Cope, and I still have copies here. Uh, it's called Solo? Solos. Is that it? Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 So that those people who who started hearing Peter earlier will get a chance to go go deeper with that. And I don't know if we still have time for Q and A, but uh, you, you're going to introduce Peter. Okay. I have to sit down. This is rather long. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, give you a snippet of who Mr. Bailey really is. A. Peter Bailey, an acclaimed author, lecturer, and journalist, was born in Columbus, Georgia, and raised in Tuskegee, Alabama. As a student at Howard University, 
He was introduced to the studies of African American, African Chinese, Japanese, and Native American history. And he was a founding member of the organization Afro-American Unity, the OAAU, organized in 1964 by Brother Malcolm X. Mr. Bailey was editor of the OAAU newsletter Backlash. He was one of the last few persons to speak with Brother Malcolm X on the day of his assassination, February 21st, 1965, and served as one of the Paul Barrett at his funeral. He contributed to numerous books, articles, and documentaries about the celebrated leader. Mr. Bailey has lectured at a myriad of colleges and universities throughout North America on the legacy of Brother Malcolm X. He has also lectured uh, on Harlem, New York, the civil rights movement, the black press, several of the other topics in which he draws from his vast reservoir of historical and cultural knowledge and uses his powerful voice to inform, educate, and inspire. Mr. Bailey, a former editor of Ebony Magazine, is the author of Witnessing Brother Malcolm X, The Master Teacher, a memoir, Harlem Precious Memories, Great Expectations. He co-authored The Revelations, the Autobiography of Alvin Ailey, with Alvin Ailey, and he was a co-author of Seventh Heaven, of Seventh Child, a family memoir of Malcolm X with Ronnell P. Collins, nephew of Malcolm. Mr. Bailey is the author of Harlem Hospital Story, 100 Years of Struggle Against Illness, Racism, Harlem, Precious Memories, Great Expectations. He and the late Earl Grant conceived and formatted the book, Malcolm X, The Man of His Time. While Associate Director of the Black Theater Alliance, Mr. Bailey was the editor of BTA Newsletter and was a member of the 1975-76 Tony Awards Nominating Committee. Woo, Lord Jesus. <laughs> he has also contributed articles to numerous publications, including Essence, Black Enterprise, Jet Magazine, The New York Times, The Negro Digest, Black World, The Black Collegiate, um, The New York Daily News, The Amsterdam News, The Chronicle of, in Charleston, South Carolina, The Richmond Free Press, The Washington Informer, and The Black Collegiate Magazine. He is the former editor of Vital Issues the Journal of African-American Speeches. He writes a bi-monthly column entitled Reality Check for the Trice Edley Wire Service. He, is, he was former president of the C. Dolores Tucker Legacy Branch of Basala. And uh, he is also the organizer and creator of Positive Black Books in Action. In December of 2018, Mr. Bailey accepted an invitation to participate at the PAFM pre-Congress in Accra, Ghana. Although Mr. Bailey had previously traveled to the East African nations of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Cairo in the 70s, he had not flown since 1985. The chance to meet Pan-Africans from throughout the world and to visit the door of no return was an opportunity of a lifetime. Mr. Bailey is the book entitled Brother Malcolm X, Strategic Pan-Africanism, An Important Guide for People of African Descent. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Professor A. Peter Bailey. say that we are, and I said earlier, we are commemorating a, a, a great man, we're commemorating a great human being, we're commemorating a great black man, we're commemorating a great Pan-Africanist, and we're commemorating a, a master teacher. Uh, Brother Malcolm, to me, uh, is a person more than anyone else that I am aware of. You know who, who enlightened us about the real deal in the United States of America. He made he made, he told us the real deal, and 
as opposed to what we had been getting before. And he and he stated it directly and honestly. And he always been very, very he knew that there were people in audiences when he spoke who were there for one reason to catch him factually wrong. That's when they came to the meeting. They they came to want to catch him in something that they could then use against him. And he was real aware of that. And he taught us to be aware of that. And uh, and when we and those kind of things, to make sure that you can whatever you write or say that you can back it up. Uh, if it's an opinion, then it's an opinion. And, uh, if it's a fact, make sure you understand that it's a fact. So um, uh, to me, uh, uh, as I said before, the you know, brother was, was a master teacher. And, and I think it's very important that we understand uh, what he was doing internationally, because this is why he was assassinated. And by the way, folks, um, please don't say he was killed. Because, you know, you say he was killed, you say, well, was he killed by his, by his uncle? Was he run over by a car? Was he, you know, uh, shot by, uh, you know, someone in the streets? No, assassinated right away that you know that we talk, this is a political situation. This is not, you know, he was assassinated. When you say he was assassinated, you say Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Edgar Evans was assassinated. Uh, and don't just use the word kill. Uh, because, it, it, again, and that, that's the kind of thing, one of the things that we learned from Brother Malcolm, that I learned from him, was to be very careful of the words so that they were clear. Yeah. And uh, and and, uh, and when you when you're dealing with people when you're trying to pass out you know on information, uh, I remember that Brother Malcolm on on uh, as I said before on February the twentieth, uh, how he was always always uh, the master teacher, the person who who. When he talked to us, when you listened to him, uh, when you heard him, you really, you, you well, not have got the books. If he talked about a book he had read or he quoted from something, you tried to find that so you could read it, you know, if it was a book. Or if he, if he gave you, if he did a quote, you wrote it down because you knew it was something that you might be able to use later. So, I mean, he. He, was, he taught us, myself and the other people involved in the organization of Afro-American unity. He understood the importance of Pan-Africanism, you know, and, and it didn't just have my accident. I think, I don't know whether most of you are aware, Brother Malcolm's parents were Garbiacs. Yeah. Yes. yes. They were yes. strong Garbiacs. Yes. Yes. His, his mother was a, 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 a wrote for the, for the, uh, the Garbiac newspaper. You know, so uh, he, he, as he grew up, and he used to tell us, you know, he kind of went astray, uh, but he didn't get, you know, too far away. You know, he, he it was always that thing that he had there, uh, and and and, and as, I, as he always told us about his joy of reading. You know, he had a tremendous joy of reading, and this stayed with him, you know, throughout his life, uh, even when he, even when he was doing his little thuggish days. He still read a lot, so he was up on what was going on. The uh, the day of the assassination. No, the most I, the, 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 I think it's very important to understand something. During that time, Brother Malcolm was out there. The United States was involved in a tremendous propaganda war. With Russia, they were, you know, the so-called Cold War. Yeah, this was a, this was a war, a propaganda war, because I always believed, and and I still believe, that it was no way, both the Russians, who are just as white as the yeah. North Americans, yeah. <laughs> they knew that if they got into a war, and start throwing nuclear bombs at each other, that there would be the end of European domination. Of world affairs, so they would fuss each other and get up to a point right. that one of them would bag down, you know, slow down, and uh, and of course the Russians were using the whole racial situation in the United States against the United States on a regular basis, 
you know, and and um, uh, Brother Malcolm had decided, but we formed the Organization of Afro American Community, and it was it was named after the Organization of African Community, which was formed the previous year, in uh, 1963, in uh, and had its first meeting in, in Ethiopia, out of South of Ethiopia. The second meeting was scheduled in 1964 in Cairo, uh, and so Brother Malcolm stood up. His goal was to take the United States government before the UN Commission on Human Rights and accuse it of being either unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of black people in this country. That was what he was trying to do. That was his goal. Now, I doubt if most people are aware of this. That's my fault here. The United States, the United States and at this time, there was, a, there was something called the United Nations Charter on Human Rights. And if you felt as though your country, your government, was violating uh, that charter, you could go to the, you know, go to the UN yourself and make an appeal to the UN Commission on Human Rights. But you could not do that if your country had not signed the charter. And the, because of what was going on. In this country, they didn't want a black. They didn't want a black person in this country to be able to take our case directly to the UN Commission on Human Rights. Uh, now we know the United States could have, you know, told the UN Commission, hey, get out of it, get out of it, leave me alone. But it would have been a tremendous, devastating propaganda blow if they had if they had to defend themselves from anything issued by the UN Commission on Human Rights. So, uh, Brother Malcolm, so. So he knew since, since he could not take it there himself because the United States had not signed the, the, doc, the, signed the charter, his goal was to get African countries. Now he could have probably gone to somebody like Russia or China or somebody like that. They would have probably done it, you know, easy. But he didn't want that. He wanted to get an African country or some African countries to take the, our case there. So he spent in... in Last, during the last year of his life, he did a lot of traveling in Africa with presidents, President uh, Nyeri of, not, of uh, Tanzania, Nkuma of Ghana, uh, 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 Turi of Guinea, Kenyatta of Kenya, Nyeri of Tanzania, uh, oh, Uganda, Uganda, Uganda. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, for I, I, I should have, I should have had that down in front of me. The rest, but he had meetings with these. He, with the, he had meetings with these seven African leaders. As a result of that, they invited him to attend the OAU, the Organization of African Union meeting in Cairo in 1964, as an observer, not as a participant. Because he had, you know, he, he, but as an observer, and he went there and he distributed this eight-page document. Uh, explaining the whole situation that was going on in the United States at that time. He gave it, he, gave it to, he passed it out to everybody who was there. He, he gave it to people who came to press conferences. I mean, he really exposed internationally what was going on. And as you can imagine, the United States State Department and the FBI and those folks were very, very upset. I got the FBI files. Uh, they were they were following him and watching every move he made. They were very upset about what he was doing in this terms, you know, because it was hurting them from a propaganda perspective, hurting them seriously from a propaganda perspective. The African, because of what he did, the Organization of African Unity issued a resolution condemning racial discrimination in the United States. They had never done it before, and they haven't done it since. They, they did that, they, they issued that in 1964 as a direct result of the groundwork laid by, by Brother Malcolm. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe, folks, uh, that when they sent that resolution, <coughs> issued a resolution doing that as a result of what Brother Malcolm had done, I think that's the Diego Hooper that said, you know, you got to go. I think from then on, they started planning uh, his assassination. Because they saw that this brother truly had the ability 
was developing this international connection and was being, being given representation. He was being treated almost like, like he was our foreign minister. You know, he was a foreign minister of, of, of black folks, you know, to the world. And uh, so they, they got, I think that's when they decided that we got to do something about that. And they started seriously planning uh, later what became his assassination. Uh, I believe strongly that Brother Malcolm was well aware that what he was doing was dangerous. He knew yeah. that. He was not doing it uh, uh, without being aware of that. He told us that. He made us aware of that. You know, he he uh, sometimes uh, would say things like, you know, uh, you all got to be ready to do something if I'm not around. You know, of course, we didn't want to hear that. You know, we didn't really want to hear any kind of way of him not being around. And, and uh, uh, so on the day of the assassination, I remember going to the Audubon Ballroom that day. Uh, I'm not going to say that we knew something, or at least I did, you know, thought something was going to happen. Because we had had, we've been hearing those threats, you know, all throughout, you know, throughout the year. And uh, I said this earlier, and, and I, I'm going to repeat it to your, to this group, because I think it's very important to, to see what a truly, to why, why the brother has such a strong uh, hold on, on, on my mind. On February the 20th, the day before he was assassinated, two weeks before, he had been banned from France. A week before, his home had been firebombed, put his wife and his children in danger. All the clothing of the children had been burned up. So I wrote a newsletter. I wrote a kind of, a, not a newsletter, but like a news release that I was going to distribute the next day at our rally, basically saying that, you know, we support Brother Malcolm and we don't care what these people say, we're going to continue supporting him. And I'd be, I'd be very frank with you all. I don't know everything I've put in that newsletter. But we had written it, I had written it. We had run off 500 copies. And Brother Malcolm came to the Audubon Ballroom that Sunday. Now we're talking February 20th. He came to the Audubon, to the, our meeting place in Harlem, the OAAU meeting place. And when he came in, I showed him this thing that I wanted to distribute the next day at the at the, uh, at the at the rally, he read it and he said, "Brother Peter, uh, I wish you would not distribute this." So I said, "Okay." I didn't even I didn't question it. I knew you know, Brother knew what was going on. I don't know who got him. I've never seen one of them since then. So if somebody got him. Maybe the FBI was the one who got him. But uh, the next day. And I'm sitting in the, I'm, when he comes to the Audubon Ballroom on February 21st, I was already there. And I was kind of, they had a, the, the Audubon Ballroom is huge for people who've never seen it. It's a huge space. It's long and it's wide. And that's where a lot of black groups and organizations in, in, in Harlem and, and, and in New York City would have affairs there because of, of the location and the space that was there. So, um, I was sitting in the little lobby area, a very small lobby area, and I always remember that I'm sitting facing the, you know, the steps that he would talk about when they would be coming in, and right off of the steps, to the right side of the steps, was the office, and I'm looking in the office, and I know I saw three white policemen in that office. I know I saw those three white men in that office, and uh, so Brother Malcolm came in, and he saw me, you know, he said, uh, Brother Peter, when you get Get a chance to come next to uh, I, I, I want to talk to you. So I said, okay. And about five or six minutes later, I went next to eight. Now remember that this brother is under a lot of pressure. His home had been firebombed. He had been banned from France. All kind of things were going on. But you know why he had wanted me to come next to He said to me, I hope, he was concerned about my feelings. He said, I hope you understand why I asked you to not. Uh, Right, you know, uh, I know you put work into it. I hope you understand why I asked you to not distribute it. I said, oh, yes. You know, 
a show came there. We we talked talked about other things. I remember there was there had been a paper in the New York Times that day about him, and I, I had clipped it out and taken it with me, so I showed him the uh, I gave him a copy of the article, and and uh, there were both about, I think about five other people back there. They were you know everybody doing things getting ready for him to come out. So finally, after I've been looking at me about fifteen to twenty minutes, he said. Uh, uh, the other, which one of you know what Reverend Galamison looks like? Well, Reverend Galamison was the minister who was going to make an appeal to the people who came to the rally uh, for, you know, for clothing for his children. You know, uh, uh, this is a, you know, a, 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 a Baptist, a black Baptist, uh, you know, minister. And he was going to come and make a speak to the audience and, and make an appeal. So he said, which one of you, do, I, do either one of you know what he looks like? And I said, well, I don't know him, but I know what he looks like. He said, well, would you please go out front and wait on him and then bring him backstage when he comes in? So I went back and sat down again in this little lobby area. I sat down on this little bench facing the entrance. And uh, I saw those white cops in that, you know, in, the, in the office. And I heard Brother Malcolm say, assalamu alaikum. The next thing I heard was shots. I mean, it sounded to me like a hundred shots. I don't know exactly how many it was. Myself and about four or five other people who were in the, in the I mean, we, we kind of, and also on the on the right hand side of the bathroom. So we ran into the bathroom. Hi, hi. Uh, hi. Hold my clothes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We ran into the bathroom. When the shooting stopped, I came out of the bathroom and then I ran into the Audubon Ballroom and I ran down, and the Audubon Ballroom, most of you know about, it's huge. I mean, it's almost like a football field. Long and it's real wide, and and it had benches and booths on the side, but the, but the middle of the place was all open because they would put chairs in there. But when they had events there, and also people did dancing there, so they couldn't have uh, you know things that you know chairs and things that you could not move. And when I went into the other ballroom, I saw that the chairs were all knocked over. People were screaming and crying, and and I ran down and I ran up on stage, and I came out and I saw Brother Malcolm. And uh, Mary Koshiyama, who was a Japanese American woman who had become very friendly, supportive of us. She couldn't join the OEAU, but she was very supportive of, of the OEAU because she came from a, her family uh, had, had, been, had been doing World War II. Her family were, were, were you know, native born Americans, quote unquote, but they had been put into the concentration camps during World War II. She had been put in the concentration camps. So, you know, she had a very different attitude. And, and, and she was very supportive of Brother Malcolm, even though she, you know, she couldn't officially join the, the OAAU. But she had, she had been there that day. She had Brother Malcolm in her arms. He was laying on the floor, saying, Lord, and I looked down, and I saw all these bullet holes in his body. And I saw them. It looked like his whole, from the waist up, you know, you could see up, from the waist up to the neck, and I saw all these bullet holes in his body. And I was saying to him, I said, oh, he's going to die, he's going to die. He's going to die. And the brothers uh, finally came with a, with a stretcher. Uh, and, and, and Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, which was across the street from the Audubon Ballroom, not a doctor or a nurse or any kind of uh, a medical assistant would come to the Audubon. Not, not one of them. The brothers had to literally take the stretcher with those rolling stretchers bring it over, put Brother Malcolm, and take it, take it back over, over there. Uh, and I know when I, I finally left that day, and uh, I, will, I will never forget that I was walking, just come, a friend of mine, and I, I, was, I, was, I jumped out off the stage, and I'm walking toward the way down. I saw these three cops who I had seen in that room. And they were just, you know, wandering around like they were, you know, at some, of, you know, some charity event, at some charity event or something like that. You know, they were not acting anything like what, what, what was going on. And I was just getting ready to say something to them. I really was. I was so angry when I saw them. And this friend of mine grabbed me and said, "Don't say a word." And I'm glad he did because if I had started yelling at them, they probably would have used it as a to arrest me. You know. And uh, so he took me out, and then I got to came home. And uh, Sister Betty called me a few days later 
and actually bring up your pallbearer at his funeral. And uh, I said yes. And I was. I'd never been a pallbearer at a funeral before. At this time, I was just, the assassination happened three days before my 27th birthday. So, you know, that was probably the worst birthday of my life, was that number 27. And um, so I said no. I said yes, I would be a pallbearer. And, 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 and but you know, y'all, I could not tell my mother that. Because although my mother, you know, kind of liked a lot of things Brother Malcolm said, she did not want me associated with Brother Malcolm. She thought I was going to get killed. I mean, she literally believed that I was going to get I could get killed by being involved with him, and she did not want that to happen. So she was, so when, when, when I did not tell her I was going to be a pallbearer at his funeral. So my mom was working at a hospital and uh, what do you call nurses who are not really, they're not officially nurses. Practical, I think it's practical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she was there. And so when we were coming out of the, coming out of the church, you know, with the, uh, with the casket, and I'm, a, I'm in front, on, you know, and, and they told, they told my mom, oh, she was doing the work. And they said, oh, they're coming out. So she came down to look at it, you know, we would come out of here, and of course she saw me. And she and, her, and my mother would just would scream, and they had to literally give her sedatives to, uh, to get her you know, straightened out. Mm -hmm. She was so upset. You know, she just knew that somebody was crossing the street. And especially said I was one of the, you know, one of the first Paul Barron to come out. You know, she just knew somebody across the street was going to shoot me and kill me. And, um, and later, when I, I saw her, I had, I had kind of, Apologize for not telling her, and I said, "Mom, I did not tell you because I knew you would, you know, you would try to stop me." She said, "Oh yes, believe me, if you had told me, you would not have been a pawn." She said, "Because I had to give somebody to come and take you somewhere and lock you up, you know, you would not have been a pawn." I said, "So you, you know, you did the right thing in that sense, you know, by not by not telling me until so it was all over." But uh, Brother Malcolm, man, was. Uh, it was, it was it was terrible. It was terrible. It was really really terrible. Those those days after the assassination and then the, the funeral. And uh, I'm I'm going to stop there and uh, and answer questions. Even one of you may have questions. But but as I said before, this brother was to me a great human being, a great black man, a great Pan Africanist. And a master teacher. I want you to talk just a little bit about your book that you're writing now. Okay. I, I feel I feel very strongly that many of the books about Brother Malcolm. And especially the ones that get the high praise, like Mad and Marable's book and Les Payne's book, they do practically they, they have practically nothing to say about what Brother Malcolm was doing internationally. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do, I'm, I'm putting together a book, and it's going to be solely of what he was doing internationally. Mm -hmm. It's going to be solely of what he was doing internationally, and 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 how he was being really he was being treated internationally at that time, almost like he was the foreign. Like he was the Secretary of State for Black people in this country, and that was really, really, really upsetting uh, the United States and the United States uh, government. And uh, so that that uh, uh, I decided to do that because I wanted to 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 make people aware, at least introduce. I'm not right that book. You know, to really do that thing, just to give the right five to vote, four five hundred page book. I got about 175 pages, but it's going to, I think it's going to be a good introduction and provide some introduction to what he was doing internationally. And I think that's very important for us to know because that was what led to his assassination. You can, you know, uh, uh, Sharon and I are doing this because, you know, Pete is bucking on us. We, we had hoped to have the, the uh, book here tonight, but the, what, say what the title is again. Uh, the title of the book is for the Malcolm X's Strategic Pan-Africanism. And the subtitle is An Important Guide for People of African Descent. Mm -hmm. 
And what I did with the book is I has four sections. The first section is all him. Everything in the first section is either, either something written by Brother Melvin, letters he wrote to people, news releases that he wrote, uh, statement, the statement that he issued to the African uh, governments, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's what's, that's what's in the, uh, in the uh, you know, in the first section. The second section, which is most entirely of the FBI files, the FBI files were just today for I didn't change nothing. I wanted to show them exactly what they I did. We did nine issues of, of our newsletter, The Black Lash. And the only reason that I included those is because we were covering what he was doing in Africa. We had pictures of him with you know with, with African leaders when he was in Africa. So I got all and, and then the fourth section is covered for what he was doing in, in foreign press, especially in newspapers uh, in Africa. And in Africa, I, I, I was able to print the entire articles. With the American press, uh, when I took the book down to the copyright people, they sent it back to me so they could not give it a copyright because this was, you know, I did not, I was, I, this was, I not given, you know, um, the right kind of uh, things to people. I should have said, got permission. I had to get permission. Well, I knew that you could only do so many words without permission. So I made sure I said another word, but they didn't want to hear that. And the articles from the New York Times, and, you know, the, 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 uh, some of the major white newspapers. So what I did, I just decided to cut them out. I just put the title of the articles that they wrote and the subtitle and the date that it ran. That's it. But the articles that were printed in the African newspaper, the entire articles will be included. And, and Peter, when will it be here at the St. Conference? Uh, hopefully by the end of March. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure, but hopefully by the end of March. Because so, so, I am doing, I'm doing what they call self-public. Because if you have a publisher, then the publisher really has control of your book for at least 10 years. And I want to have total control of, of this of, of this of this So I decided to, you know, to friends a couple of friends are going to contribute and help me uh, pay to a uh, pressure to, to print the book. Any other questions? Let, let me just, I, I need to uh, correct one mistake that I made. I, I neglected to mention that we, one of our members of the Positive Black Folks and actually couldn't be here tonight because he had an emergency, and that's Thomas Penny. And Thomas is the uh, president of the hotel group with uh, Donahoe, and he had a, uh, we talked on the phone before I came up here. I, I can't go into details, but it was it was a real emergency. Uh, but it, uh, Thomas and other people who have worked with Peter on some of the previous books, and uh, Sharon, I'm sure we'll do whatever it takes to make sure that the um, the book is included here on San Covid and maybe uh, the people who uh, who own the uh, mailing list, uh, what do you call it? mailing list, uh, whatever you call it. The, the virtual list that people goes out to people uh, will know when the book is here. Okay. Uh, any, any, any questions? Any other? Yes. Uh, could you could you you know for a break, Could you speak to about Malcolm's grandson? Uh, you know, earlier you and I had a conversation because I know a lot about it, but I found out a lot more when I spoke to you about your relationship with the family and that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have uh, had a, a rather close relationship with at least three of my Malcolms. Uh, at that time, six daughters, now one of them had, so there's now five. And I was in regular contact, one of the ones I was in regular contact with is the one who's the mother of a, who's the mother of a young Malcolm. And uh, I spent quite, a, at least, let's say, a total of 20 hours with him, talking to him. And I was trying to get him to kind of, you know, you know, kind of lay low, learn more about the grandfather, you know, read, talk to people who knew him, learn more before you get out there, you know, and expose yourself and, you know, and put yourself in, you know, in, in possible danger. And uh, he, we gave him a, you know, we gave him a, some friends and I, we gave him a birthday party uh, at, the, at, the, at the Hotel Teresa, same building where the OAU office had been. We gave, and we had him kind of talk to us about what he, about what he, his feelings about his grandfather. And that, that young brother spoke for all, all, over two hours, man. 
and he was talking about the things he had learned and things he learned about his, about his grandfather. Uh, unfortunately, I think that, that uh, he got it with some folks who were using him. They were basically using him, and I think that's what eventually led to what happened to him. Uh, he was, at first, I, think, I think he was 29 when uh, he was killed down in Mexico City. So, you know, they say he was going down to Mexico to, because, you know, some revolutionary people down in Mexico, you know, for me. Uh, I, 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 I be very afraid that I cried when I heard about what happened with young, the young brother, because I knew he was just so, he, he, when he, when he said, he told me that the fire he supposedly sent, you know, that killed his, his grandmother, he told me directly that what would really happen, he wanted to go back with, with his mother. And and uh, he had tried all kind of different things to get on his grandmother's nerves, and she would say, okay, tell her, tell her, come get it. And that didn't happen. So he decided to set this fire you know, and that that would be the thing that would really get her to say, you got to go. But he did not, he, he had no idea that she was going to come out into the hall. It was a, it was like a, you know, it was no big, it was a small, but she came out, but she had on a, like, you know, the night clothing, very thin clothing, and she had caught fire. And that's how she ended up dying. And uh, he never really got over that. When you talk, I talked to him. Like I said, I spent at least a total of at least 20 hours just by myself talking to him and listening to him and having, you know, tell me things about how he felt about different things. And telling, I, I told him about, I knew about his grandfather, you know, because um, I, 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 I basically do really know about them that most of his aunts knew because they were very young. They were like little children. The oldest one was only six years old. But it, well, and they didn't really know very much except what they had heard you know, from other people about, and their mother about, about her. And, and because of my being, you know, having been associated with her about some of the things that I do, I was able to, you know, give him some, you know, some things about his grandfather. And I was always telling the grandfather, was very careful. You know, he didn't just, just run with everybody. You know, you had to be, you had to, you know, he had to be, you had to know who you were. You know, because, you know, he understood that the government would, 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 would put people on you. I use people, you know, to, to get me, have somebody to come friendly with you, so they can get information and that kind of stuff. So we have to, we, we tried to tell him, but uh, it was really unfortunate what happened to that young brother. It really was. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Yes. What, what, what uh, that eight-page document you said Malcolm gave to those African leaders? Where is that at? You know, uh, where can? I think it is in the Malcolm X papers. I think they went to Schomburg. That's what I was asking. I was thinking Schomburg. Schomburg. Right but I have a copy of it, and, I, and, and I'm putting the entire document is going to be in my, you know, in, in my book. Okay. Where he, he, you know, and he tells it. What he basically said to the Africans is that y'all better be careful. Don't let the United States fool you. You know, look what they've done to us, and then here's what they really think about you. You know, because I, I was told that that uh, they told the African diplomats they would tell them when they came over here the ones who were diplomats, don't go to don't go to stay away from black folks. Mm -hmm. They told the African diplomats to don't to stay away from black folks. I was told. You know, and they had to wear that that that, that native dress so that the stores and places would know that they were in the diplomatic force, so they wouldn't like, not serve them with that kind of stuff. And uh, so, Brother Malcolm, uh, uh, the type of thing that he was doing was, 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 was a threat right. to that U.S. government policy. And, uh, and, and when you think about, and, 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 and when he traveled, he met he met seven African leaders, uh, as I said earlier, who who invited him to to the OAU conference. That was unheard of. Yeah. He was the first black person from this country to be invited to the OAU conference. Was unheard of, and then they issued a resolution condemning racism. I mean, it wasn't the most 
most powerful document ever written. But I mean, anything like that was was, was enough to get those folks to the FBI saying, hey, this cat's got to go. He is. And they and I and, and and the African when I have copies of newspapers that ran an African African uh, newspaper, you know, welcoming him to Africa and talking about him. I mean, treating him like he was a you know, I, like I said before, like he was our Secretary of State. To some degree, he was our Secretary of State, and they got very upset about that. Any other? Hold on, hold on. Sharon, how 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 are we on time? We pay it for Okay. Uh, maybe you can talk with them afterward. Let, let me just, on behalf of the positive black folks in action, thank all of you who stayed with us, uh, even though we got started late. And I'm sorry. We, we uh, Sharon said we're out of time. You know, so uh, maybe you can walk down here, and as Peter's walking out, because he's not the fastest guy in the world, you can ask your question. <laughs> but again, they thank everybody for coming out. Give yourselves a hand. There's a hadith that says, that none are believers unless you love for your brother and sister that which you love for yourself. So those of you who are fortunate enough to be here tonight, share this information with somebody who's not here. Uh, Keith, did you have an uh, announcement? Okay. Thank you very much.